This is the Coming Home Podcast with John Allen. And a three, and a two, and a one. Welcome everybody to this episode of the Coming Home Podcast with John Allen. Yeah, here I am. Battered, but not broken. Down, but not out. Dragging myself in an, into an upright position. Um, <laughs> yeah, you're going to have to excuse my somewhat uh, raspy voice, a little more raspy than normal. Uh, I've been intubated. Yeah. You can extrapolate further and uh, come to the conclusion that I've had an operation. Yeah. I've had an operation. Those of you who follow me on <clears throat> on social media, especially on Facebook, you know that uh, I had an emergency surgery uh, here just a few days ago. What is this, my third day coming home uh, since the operation? Coming home, coming home podcast. How about that? Yeah, this is my third day at home. Um, I wanted to do a quick solo podcast episode already that first day after I had gotten back, but uh, my body said no. They, uh, (laughs) as I told my two young children here, um, I went in the hospital, they cut my head off and fixed a few things and then sewed it back on. And it's funny, they're not, uh, they're barely past that age where I can say things like that and, and get away with it. Um, they kind of, they kind of smelled, uh, the BS in that statement there. No, um, I had a, what would you call that? A, um, well, it was a neck surgery. They had to remove a disc and put in an artificial disc. And this happened like, yeah, I mean, I, I barely blinked and it happened. <laughs> Let me just tell you guys the story real quick. Um, I was uh, in the planning stages with a surgeon, great surgeon. Hello, Shirsten Lindgren. I love that woman. Great surgeon. She's been uh, working on my shoulder for the last few years. Um, She's done um, three of the last seven operations, seven or eight operations. I lose count. And uh, in preparation for this upcoming shoulder surgery, she ran an MRI on my shoulder and neck and head. Because, you know, we're trying to figure out where all the pain and some of the disability, some of the, the, the reasons for the lack of use, lack of mobility and function in my shoulder and left arm. So she ran an MRI uh, scan, I guess you would call it. I'm thinking in Norwegian and trying to speak English here. That's a sign that I've been here in Norway too long. <clears throat> Excuse me. But um, that MRI showed that my neck was basically doing a good old, beautiful little zigzag, which was weird. I never would have thought that I had any problems uh, with my neck. You know, I can't say that I've felt any, well... I've had neck pain, I guess, but I've always just assumed it was because of the shoulder, you know, muscle tension and whatnot, because of the pain I've been having in my shoulder all these years. So to find out that I had um, not only a problem in my neck, but a serious problem, you know, lucky to not be paralyzed (laughs) is what we're talking about here. So they rushed it through, and, and days later, not even a week after they found the problem through the MRI scan, Uh, not even a week after that, I was into the hospital. It's called Eriks Hospital. It's like the biggest hospital here in Norway, there in Oslo, Uh, in the hospital, and uh, out with the chainsaw and hammer for an operation. It's, um, (laughs) it's, It's pretty amazing. It's a fascinating surgery when they're going to remove a disc or, or, you know, saw down some vertebrae or replace vertebrae, replace disc and all that in your neck. It's a very fascinating surgery. You can, you can look this up on uh, YouTube. Just, just type in neck surgery on YouTube. And I found this one where they had a uh, cadaver laying on a board, uh, laying on the table there. And um, 
apparently it's an educational video because the surgeon is is talking an audience through you don't see the audience but you can hear them in the background asking questions and the surgeon is talking them through it and it's pretty amazing you know they make a about an inch long incision in your neck it's not a very big incision I can't see my incision yet. It's still all bandaged up. But they make about an inch long incision in your neck. And then they, they, they open that up. And <clears throat> think about this. Your spine, your spinal column is less than an inch under your skin. Think about that. And what they do is when they open that up, um, the incision can be somewhat to the left or somewhat to the right of your Adam's apple. So they open that incision up, then they stick their fingers in and they literally shove your Adam's apple, your trachea, everything. They just shove it off to the side. So all that good stuff that you (laughs) breathe through and swallow through uh, is now now in an S (laughs) because they've shoved it to the side. Excuse me. Um... So that is, you know, that plus being intubated, you know, when they have to shove that metal thing down your throat and then stick a breathing tube in, you combine that with them turning my beautifully symmetrical trachea into an S. That is why my voice is extremely irritated right now. So I probably won't be yapping at y'all for too very, too much longer, uh, because I just don't have the voice for it. <clears throat> it hurts. Yeah, so they go in, and then they, um, they, 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 they chop, chop out the di- You know, it depends on what the surgery actually is, but let's say it's a disc surgery. They chop out the damaged disc and take it out. And then you can see it's like a half-inch space between the vertebrae. Uh, on me, it's between C, was it C5 and C6? Yeah, C5 and C6. So there's like a half inch gap there. I would imagine if if you stood up at that point, if you woke up from the anesthesia and you stood up, your head would just fall over, probably snapping your spinal column and all the nerves. But it's it's real freaky. And then they take a uh, they take this saw. It's like a saw slash drill type of thing and clean out the space in between those those vertebrae and then they insert um it's like a um i don't i don't want to i don't know if it's metal i don't want to say it's metal metal titanium or is it some sort of yeah i you know what i i don't know some star trek looking piece of thing let's call it metal that they put in there in place of the disc um they jam it in there and then it's like a micro millimeter, you know, like one, like a quarter millimeter uh, away from your spinal column. It's just fascinating the precision uh, that they uh, that they have when they're when they're inserting that new disc, and um, and then that's it. They just put it in and then sew you back up. And I guess what's happening now is the bones of my vertebrae in C5 and C6 are now working on growing around this artificial disc that they've inserted into my poor neck. And um, let me tell you something, people, it it doesn't hurt as bad as I thought it would. Now, um, it's not fun, I'll tell you that, but it is really not as bad as I thought it would be. The biggest problem is if I'm sitting down or if I'm getting up. You know, you'd be surprised the amount of head movement that normally comes with that motion. Um, so, so that's a that's a problem now. It's an even worse problem to lay down and get back up after laying down, lying down. Um, it it just hurts, and then there's like a constant dull ache. Um, not in my musculature in my neck, which is weird because that I'm used to. I can actually feel the pain in my cervical vertebrae in my neck. And it's a weird, achy 
kind of pain. Um, strange pain. Now, I have chosen to uh, to uh, to not be on any kind of uh, opiate pain medication. Uh, that's my choice. I'm boycotting that. Um, partially because I want to have my wits about me. I just don't like that foggy feeling that those painkillers uh, have given me in the past after operations. So uh, I came home with no opiate pain medication, <clears throat> just taking, uh, they call it Podacet, uh paracetamol, I guess is what you would call it in the States. It's like an aspirin derivative. Um, that's all I'm on. I would rather feel the pain. You know, I'm, I'm also afraid of being numbed from the pain, which would then cause me to do things that I otherwise would not do if I could feel that it hurt. You know what I mean? Um, uh, so I'm, I'm being careful. And again, uh, hats off to my shoulder surgeon who caught this neurological issue, which then led her to take an MRI, which then led her to see the neck problem. And she's the one that got the ball rolling so quickly with that uh, neurological surgeon at Eriks Hospital in Oslo here in Norway. And thank God for free medicine. How about that? <clears throat> and for the haters, I know you're going to say, well, it's not free. You pay taxes for that. Yeah, I do pay taxes for that. And I thank the good Lord that I pay taxes to get this type of medical care. You know, the taxes that we pay, I, I don't feel it. I don't notice it. That's one of the things that I was concerned with when I first moved here to Norway all those years ago. Um, you know, all these taxes I got to pay. But you know what? That fear or that the, 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 the conscious thought of paying extra taxes uh, disappeared almost immediately. Um, you know, what can I say? You know, you make the money you make uh, from your work, you pay the taxes you pay, and, and, and that's it. Here in Norway, anyway, that's it. Because we can see, I mean, we, we, we see it on a daily basis that our tax money is being used properly. And one of those proper usages is the medical system here. Uh, I'm here to tell you, it has served me well by God. Um, I try to think of all these operations I've had in the States. I'd be either bankrupt or immobile <laughs> from not being able to, to get the operations I needed. Serious shoulder problems. Like I said, seven, eight, maybe nine surgery, excuse me, surgeries altogether since 2015. That's a lot of, that's a lot of work. That's a few trips around the old, uh, the old surgical room, <clears throat> but what a great, uh, what a great experience though. Um, I got into the hospital a day early, a day before, uh, the actual operation, because they have to run a lot of tests, a lot of, you know, neurological tests and blood work and things like that. So I was in there for a whole day and, uh, that was, uh, <laughs> that was really, it was really entertaining. <clears throat> and I actually met a new friend out of it, a, a guy from England. Bob is his name. I don't want to throw his last name out. There. I'm not sure that he wants to be exposed like that. But uh, my friend Bob uh, was in the bed next to me. This is like a big, um, like a big living room, huge living room, and we were four people in there. Um, and I, yeah, I'm I'm the kind of you know I love my privacy, especially when it comes to wearing you know, buttless pajamas and, and, uh, and, uh, you know, laying in a bed and a hospital bed and all that stuff. I'd rather have my own room. We were four in this room, but it felt like it was my own room. Um, it, it felt more comfortable than living in a U.S. Marine Corps barracks. I'll put it to you that way. It's a big room. Everybody had plenty of space and, you know, and the beds were walled off. So you had some certain amount of privacy. But uh, it was fun to to be around uh, that guy Bob and you know speak a little bit of English with somebody and and yuck it up a bit. We were laughing our butts off. We had a lot of things in common. We found out, um, so that's going to be fun getting to know him. Uh, we exchanged phone numbers. Uh, and he doesn't live too very far away from me, and and we're going to hook up and uh, have a spot a tea. You know when it fits. He'll drink tea. I'll I'll have uh, coffee. I've been Norwegianized when it comes to caffeine intake. 
I'm here to tell you. And um, yeah, what was it that was so entertaining about being there? Well, one thing was getting to know Bob and, and laughing a little bit with him. But the, the two other guys, there was um, uh, this, this one guy, uh, older guy. I don't know what he was in there for, but he was pretty much immobile and very grumpy. You know, Bob and I, I, I guess I can admit we were, we got a little bit, not, not carried away. We weren't, we weren't raucous, you know, we weren't shouting and, you know, it wasn't like it was in a pub or something, but we, we probably had raised our voices a little bit and, and one, and all of a sudden this old guy on the other side of the room, eh, can you guys tone it down over there? You know, but he said it in Norwegian and he threw a few curse words in there. It was just like, oh, okay, yes, we are in a room with with somebody else. And then the other guy, I want to say he was from Pakistan um, or of Pakistani descent, I want to say. So let's say it. This guy was of Pakistani descent uh, in the other bed. Uh, And his his Norwegian wasn't very good. Um, Poor guy had a hard time, had a hard time communicating with the nurses. And... uh, and, you know, you, you, like I said, they had to run a bunch of tests on me, and I, I burnt up a lot of time joking around and getting to know Bob. But that day was a lot of just, you know, kind of laying around, doing nothing. So you, you kind of, you know, you notice the comings and goings of the the uh, nurses and the doctors, you know, talking with the other patients. So, you, you know, you, I kind of had an ear turned to it. So I'm listening. I'm like, ah, this, this, this Pakistani guy is really, uh, really struggling. Uh, with it, with his Norwegian, you know, it just kind of, you know, his grammar was all twisted and, and just, yeah, he was just having a real hard time communicating. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, after a while I get bored and, and whatnot. So I, I'm listening to this guy trying to communicate, you know, all day long, all afternoon, all evening, late into the evening, actually, you know, I'm talking like, you know, 1130, you know, midnight. And every time he was having to communicate with the nurses and whatnot, he just wasn't quite making it happen. He was really struggling. Then at, by that time, I'm so bored. I'm very engaged with this guy's communication issues. And, 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 and I kind of noticed it was almost like watching a film when you get engaged in a movie and you kind of, you know, you get angry at the bad guy and you feel for the good guy. But I'm starting to get frustrated as if this, as if it was me trying to communicate with this, with this guy from Pakistan and not being able to do it because he can't speak proper Norwegian. So I started getting frustrated actually. I'm like, Oh my gosh, you know, I, I, I need to disengage from this. So fast forward to about, <laughs> fast forward to about four o'clock. I got to I can't laugh cause it makes my throat hurt. Fast forward to about four, four thirty in the morning. I get up to go use the bathroom and this guy had pulled open the, the, uh, the, the, um, what do you call it? The curtain, you know, separating his bed from the rest of the room. So I, I walk past and I look over this poor guy is sitting there. He's got a huge operation wound on his, you know, like, like, you know, a third of his head is shaved off and there's this big, horrible looking <laughs> surgical incision, you know, all stitched up all, you know, black stitches and whatnot on the side of his head. And you talk about a humbling moment for me. It's like, you know, you can't you can't judge a book by its cover, and you can't judge a guy's communi- communication skills with your ear. Uh, from the look of that head wound that this poor guy had, it probably was something related to the trauma on his brain that was causing his uh, his communication problems. So uh, my heart goes out to that poor guy. Um, yeah, I'm giggling about it. Come on, I'm a I'm a stand up comedian, so there was there's a lot of humor in uh, in that little episode there with that guy. But uh, it kind of it's it's kind of a humbling experience, you know. I don't know what Bob was in there for. As much as we talked, I didn't we didn't talk about his issue, and I don't know what that older guy was who was pretty much immobile. I don't know what his issue was, but uh, I would imagine with it being a neurological surgical unit at that hospital. It's, uh, they're not in there for fun and games. So my heart goes out to anybody who, um, was in there while I was there and anybody who may go through that hospital 
but uh, you can know that you are in good hands. What a, what a friendly bunch of nurses. Uh, I got to tell you, when I, when I, and, and this is because of concrete experiences that I've had at hospitals before, uh, both in the States and here in Norway, uh, I, I, I get a little anxious because I wonder how they're going to treat me. Uh, when I go in, I've had some, I've had some negative experiences. Uh, you know, if you hear, um, you hear a black guy or a black lady who's got a little gray in their hair and they tell you about how they get treated different in a healthcare system, you might want to listen to them. There's, there's a lot of truth in that. Um, I mean, just take it as uh take it as truth. If you hear any stories from black people about how they get treated differently in a healthcare system. Unfortunately, that happens. So I get a little anxious uh, um, every time I have to go, not necessarily for a doctor's appointment. You know, I know my doctor. He's a good guy. Um, uh, my, my, my surgeon who's been working with me all these years on my shoulder, she's a great lady. But these little extra trips, <laughs> you know, these little things where I'm meeting a whole new crew of people uh, as a regular patient, you know, there's a little bit of anxiety. But these people at uh, Rick's Hospital in, in Oslo, they were... Uh, just just great people, beautiful people. So hats off to them. Swallowing a little bit of water there, it's not easy. <clears throat> well, yeah, uh, let me tell you about this. So uh, the nurse comes, you know, the day of the operation, she comes in, she gives you, you know, gives me that little plastic cup with... Uh, I think there's like four four tablets in there. A um, couple of oxy, a couple of this, that, and the other. Who knows what it was? I know there was some oxy in there, and I felt that right away. Started to feel real dozy. And, you know, they do it to, you know, dampen your pain receptors already before the operation even starts and, and to calm you down, get you calm. So they wheel me in there uh, and into the operation room. And, uh, you know, and they start doing their thing and they set the IV line in my, in the back of my hand. And, and then here comes the anesthesiologist and they explain that. Yeah, and here's, uh, we're going to give you a little bit of, uh, something that's going to numb you up a little bit. You'll start to feel a little tingly. Now we're going to give you this, which is going to do that. And now here's this mask, you know, breathe, breathe this in. You know, and he's chit-chatting with me. I don't even remember what he was saying, but I remember we were just chit-chatting, talking. I'm sure they're doing that to see how <laughs> how much I faded out. And the last thing I remember hearing was he says, uh, okay, and now we're going to push a little fentanyl. And I just thought, fentanyl, oh, my God, that's what killed Prince. And then I was out. <laughs> that's just not what I wanted to hear as, as a life, well, not a lifetime, but... Um, I've been a Prince fan since his first album in 78 and all that. And what, what a tragedy to hear how uh, he had his problems with uh, pain issues with his hips and whatnot. And, uh, and then it was fentanyl that, that killed him in the end. So when this guy says, I'm going to push a little fentanyl right away at my last, I was, oh God, that's what killed Prince. <clears throat> Fade to black. It's just such a weird thing. If you've never been operated on, it's just such a weird thing when they put you under. I mean, it literally feels like you just closed your eyes and then open. It's, it's like a blink and then you're coming back. And um, here's another thing that was really cool. Um, here's, here's a vision that's going to stick with me for quite a while. When I woke up, uh, let's back up a little bit. Um, you know, this was a rather serious operation. Like I said, this was nothing to play around with. So Snoopy, the lovely Snoopy, you guys have heard her on several episodes. She's been my guest here. She wanted to go with me and, you know, just be there. Um, you know, I, I, I tease her a lot. I talk about her a lot. I troll her mercilessly on social media uh, but I hope you guys know it's all in fun. She's not, you know, I, I talk about her being brutal and, and uh, you know, eating, you know, animals live before they're even dead, things like that. And while she has this hardness to her countenance, she is uh, all things warm and soft and loving 
and caring. She's just, a, she's a perfect mother, perfect wife. I couldn't ask for anything better. And part of that comes through in situations like this, you know, with this operation that all of a sudden fell in our lap and it's getting rushed through and she really wanted to be there. But of course, COVID, <clears throat> there's all these COVID restrictions, which of course restricts access to the hospital when it comes to visitors, you know, when it comes to people who are not there for a specific procedure. <clears throat> so of course she couldn't come. She couldn't be there. So imagine my surprise and my delight. Like I said, the last thing I hear is they're going to push a little fentanyl. I think, oh my God, no, that's what killed Prince. And then bang, like a, for me, a split second later, I hear background noise. I hear people talking. I open my eyes and what do I see? That beautiful little face, that strawberry blonde hair, those weird alien-like green gray eyes, those cheekbones, <clears throat> and that turned up nose, and that dimpled chin. Snoopy was there. I couldn't couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe she pulled that off. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we had been talking before the operation that of course she was saying, of course, if she can, she'll be there. You know, she she had the number to the uh, to the uh, surgical team. Um, <clears throat> to the office there. Excuse me. Boy, this throat. I got to wind this up. She had the telephone number. She was going to call. But, of course, it's a long drive. You know, it, it can be up to an hour depending on weather weather and traffic into Oslo. So, you know, how the heck was she going to time it to where she could, you know, be there if something went wrong or, you know, just to be there? How was she going to time that? So I had zero hope you know, I, I wasn't anticipating her being there at all. So I'm just here to tell you, you know, I'm, a, you know, this big, strong guy, power lifter and all that stuff. But I tell you, uh, it that that woman melts my heart. She she consistently does it on a daily basis. And uh, boy, the melting was really uh, <laughs> in swing when I opened my eyes and, and there she was. So... Uh, and, and I, I, I just, it just blows my mind that she that she did that. She has come through in so many uh, cool ways <laughs> up through the years. But that right there, be, being there, you know, I got to admit, I, I was worried. You know, they're, they're, they're sawing in my neck, for goodness sake. So I, I'll admit it, I was worried. I was very worried about that. So what a calming thing. Uh, to open my eyes and, and to see her there. So that's, she, she's come through so many ways uh, for me up through the years, but that's, uh, that takes the cake right there. Oh, cake. Did I say cake? Wow. So hats off to Snoopy. So now it's all about recovery. Now it's all about getting my life back. Um, but we still have this shoulder issue waiting. Um, they're wondering, you know, the question is, is did this neck surgery, the fact that they fixed this prolapse or this zigzag in my neck, whatever it is, which by the way, we have no idea how it happened, which is a very interesting thing. That's something I want to be thinking on going forward because we have no idea how that happened. But the question is, is did this operation, uh, w will it fix my pain issues in my shoulder? Uh, that remains to be seen. It's going to be a while. We'll see what happens over the next one, two, three months. Um, maybe there was, maybe we're talking about some nerves that were getting pinched because my neck was so bad. Maybe that is some of the cause of the pain and loss of function in my shoulder. Uh, to tell the truth, I don't think I'm going to get any function back in my shoulder. My shoulder is pretty much dead. Cannot raise my arm over my head, cannot raise it in front of me, uh, and I have maybe uh, 10 to 15% lateral function uh, in, the, in that shoulder. Um, but if I could just get to where there was no pain, because I got to tell you, my last operation was in May 2019, and ever since then, it's just been hellish, hellish pain in my shoulder, and I'm, I'm not exaggerating. <clears throat> a little more water, thank you. 
<clears throat> excuse me, it's been hellish pain. Um, and boy, what an operation that was in May 2019. They took an Achilles tendon from a cadaver and put that in my lower trapezius and brought it around uh, laterally across my shoulder, basically to replace the infraspinatus, which is responsible for outward rotation in the shoulder because that tendon was totally gone. Uh, so that's what that operation was for the last time. Um, and it hasn't seemed to have worked. I cannot activate. We were hoping that I would be able to activate that tendon by now and put it to use and be able to rotate my arm and give it a little more stability. But no go so far. No go. So I don't know. We'll see what happens. I've got an appointment with my surgeon in three months. We'll uh, we'll see what happens. But I, I just want to get my life back. And by my life back, I want to get my athletic life back. Uh, I haven't spoken too much about this. I've It's been a sentence here and there. Maybe some of my guests have mentioned it because they've seen my social media profile. But I am a champion and record-holding power lifter. Um, I'm in the uh, IPF, International Powerlifting Federation, and I've competed both in the Norwegian branch of the IPF and in the USA, the USAPL. Uh, got a handful of records, state records, uh, from my home state of Ohio, uh, and I have a national record here <clears throat> in Norway. Excuse me. Um, I have a 335.5 kilo Norwegian all-time raw record squat at 740 pounds. And hey, I did that the year I turned 50. <clears throat> so those of you who are out there, <clears throat> and this is what I'm talking about, about getting my life back. I'm going to be 52 this May. And I got that record, you know, in the middle of all of this shoulder surgery and everything. I did that the year I turned 50. This is in 2019 the year I turned 50. So those of you who are out there and, you, and you know, I hear guys that are like 35, not even 40 saying, Oh, it's all downhill for me. You know, well, okay. It can be all downhill for you, but I'm still on the uphill swing. There is no reason why you cannot make improvements to your strength and your general health long into your forties and even into your fifties. I know people who are doing it. Um, I'm, I'm doing it. <clears throat> like I said, a 335.5, 335.5 kilos, 740 pound national record squat. Uh, nobody in Norway has ever squatted that much, and I did it the year I turned 50. I'm so proud of that. And, and I'm saying this out loud, and I'm getting goosebumps because sometimes I forget that I have done that. But I tell you, when I think on that, when I meditate on that, when I when I acknowledge that I've done that, it, it gives me a boost. It gives me hope for for beating this shoulder issue, this neck issue. It gives me hope for getting back to that quality of life that I want. Um, and, and don't take this wrong. I am not complaining. I'm, I'm stating my desire to continue on my path towards my goal. So I'm not complaining. <clears throat> uh, I'm just acknowledging that my current situation health-wise is horrible. And I am stating, I'm reaffirming my goal. Um, and, you know, and I haven't thought about that national record squat in a long time. Um, I haven't done that in a long time. So to think about it again, it gives me a new hope, a new motivation. Like I say, just saying it out loud now, it gives me goosebumps. I'm going to be 52 and I'm going to be even stronger. I'm going to get this shoulder, you know, my benching days are over. I will never bench 225 again. It's just not going to happen. <laughs> In fact, at the competition where I squatted that 335.5, <clears throat> excuse me, you know how much my bench was? Do I know how much my bench was? 25 kilos, 55 pounds. And that's only because I had to, basically it's the bar and then the collars, the, you know, the, the locks. Uh, that is the minimum that you're allowed to bench. And you have to bench. If I wanted my, see powerlifting, for those of you who don't know, it consists of three lifts, squat, bench, and deadlift. And you have to have an approved lift in each three of those lifts 
in order for records and f- in order to place at all. So I had to bench. <laughs> so in that meet, I did 335.5 kilos and 25 kilos on the bench. So that tells you how uh, how messed up this shoulder is. I, I Basically, I can't bench. And I tell you, lifting just the bar like that was a struggle. Uh, that's how weak my shoulder was at that time, and it's even weaker now. I bet I bet I could not bench the bar now. I bet I couldn't do it. I should run out to my gym and try that. I should film that, throw that up on YouTube. You guys can see if I'm able to bench <clears throat> 50 pounds or not, 55 pounds or not. But I want to get back to being able to train. I want to get back to powerlifting. I still have goals in powerlifting. Um, I want an American national record for squat. Um, now, the record the record that I got for squat here in Norway, that's for all age groups in my weight class. You know, I beat them young cats, some thundercats who think they know everything. Uh, I beat those guys too. Uh, I have no way of beating everybody in the United States. There's some awesome, you know, the best powerlifters in the world are there, but I know I am capable of, uh, I would be in the masters two, two group, the, the, the group that's from 50 to 59 years old. I know I can get a national record squat for my age group. <clears throat> I know I can do that. Uh, in fact, the largest squat that I've ever had in a competition was 342 and a half. And I did that here in Norway. It didn't count as a national record because for a national record, you have to be at a regional level uh, competition or a national level. And this was just at a local level here in Norway. So that 342.5, that's what, 755 pounds. That did not count for a, for any kind of a record. But I do believe that in the IPF, that would be a world record for my age group. I think the 335.5 that I did would be a world record. So if I could get on a national team, whether it's the national team here in Norway or the national team back in the States, and then get on a um, international powerlifting platform or on the world championship platform, then uh, I got a shot at... Uh, at a world record squat. I, you could say I have that unofficially with what I've done with a 342.5 kilo, 755 pound competition squat. Um, color me a liar, but I do believe that that would be an unofficial world record. I do believe the world record for my age group is only around 315, 317 and a half kilos. I'm not sure how many pounds that is. Somebody check that out. Check that out online and, and drop me a message uh, on social media. You can find me if you go to my website, johnallenpod.com. That's J-O-H-N-A-L-A-N-P-O-D.com. Go to my website, and from there on the home page, on the front page, you can see um, the icon. Click the icon for Instagram or Facebook or YouTube, and you will find me on those respective social media platforms and you can drop me a message. Um, I'd appreciate that. I miss communication with you guys. Um, I'm getting some feedback. I know people out there listening. I know a lot of people are out there listening. Somebody said, and I don't know how serious I can take this, uh, but somebody said that this is the most popular English speaking podcast in Norway. If that was true, wow, what an honor that would be. I have I have yet to have looked into that to see it. I don't, I don't know how to check things like that. But um, anyway, I do know people are listening, but I miss, I miss feedback from you guys. Tell me what you think. Tell me what you're thinking on the subjects that I talk about uh, on the various episodes. <clears throat> it just would be nice to have a little dialogue with you guys, direct dialogue. I'm a talker. I love to talk. I love to discuss. I love to listen. Listen and learn. That's my... That's my goal in life. Listen, learn, and help assist. Be there for people. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to be a facilitator of ideas, a facilitator of conversation, conduit of love, if you will. I don't think that's corny to say. Those are all um, part of what my goal with this podcast is all about. 
so yeah, I'm just uh, anxious to to, uh, to to see the results of this operation. Maybe I won't need any more shoulder operations. I just want to get my life back. My message to all of you listening is is just don't don't give up. Gosh, I, I, I get frustrated for people when I hear them say themselves that everything for them is downhill when it comes to physical prestation, to physical activity and physical exploits once they reach a certain age. I mean, if you put that limit on yourself, then then and God help you, but you've, you've put that limit on yourself. But I'm here to tell you it's not necessary to do that. What if you just put a goal in front of yourself and said, I'm going to try and do this, you know, um, I'm going to try and walk, you know, 20,000 steps every day for five days of the week. You know, it doesn't have to be these big, uh, you know, powerlifting goals like what I have, you know, or what if, uh, what if uh, I'm going to go from 25 to 20% body fat in six months, you know, and then you take all the steps to, to make that happen. And I tell you, if you make a goal like that, and then you actually take the steps to do it, first of all, in order to take those steps, what do you have to do? You have to gain some knowledge about nutrition. And that is such an interesting thing to study uh, because you directly reap the benefits of that study. You know, uh, when you're in high school and you're going to, you're studying math You don't know, you may not necessarily know what the direct benefit of that is. You know, you're just learning math, you got a headache and you got to go through all these tests and exams and all that stuff. And you may not feel, you may not recognize directly what the benefit of all that study is. But I tell you, if you study nutrition, if you study health, okay, nutrition or health, nutrition slash health, you do that and then you put what you learn to active use you are literally getting the direct benefit of that on your body and mind. It will do wonders for you. Uh, read a book. <laughs> read a book. Get, get online. Um, um, find a guru online. Uh, find somebody who takes online clients. Now, you got to be careful there because not everybody is to be trusted a lot of them do these cookie cutter factory uh, programs that they just give the same thing with minor variation to everybody. But if you find a good online coach, uh, they will be able to help you with your program that you need to make changes for yourself. And you can do that at any age. You can you can literally become a health expert at any age. Because what is a health expert? You're a health expert if you know what it takes for you to function optimally. You do that, congratulations, you are now a health expert. Now, that's, you know, that's, uh, I call it YouTube knowledge. And, and some people may laugh that off, but I tell you, YouTube knowledge can change your life. There are things that you can learn on YouTube, uh, you know, on the internet in, in general, things that you can learn there. That can, I, you know, I'm studying music theory. I'm studying music theory uh, by uh, by following a guy. Rick Beato is his name. Some of you have probably heard of him. One of the most popular music channels on YouTube. Uh, the guy is a wizard with music theory. Um, you know, you, of course you can go to a university somewhere, but if you're in the States, it's going to cost an arm and a leg. Um, me, I just hate I, I, the, the idea of going to class and sitting for a lecture. I just can't, I can't stomach that. Um, so I'm about as smart as I'm going to get <laughs> on paper. Uh, so any knowledge, any practical knowledge that I gain is things that I, and I do gain practical knowledge. I'm, I'm joking here, but I do gain practical knowledge through self study. Um, I don't know, maybe there's some things that I could get interested in studying through some sort of on, you know, official online course through some sort of university. But, but, uh, the idea of actually going to a class that I just can't stomach that. Uh, the point is, is it's never too late to, to gain knowledge. Um, so gain knowledge people. And if you gain that knowledge on health, you are reaping the benefits directly. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's an egotistical study and ego. There's nothing wrong with being egotistical there's nothing wrong with doing things for yourself. If I put myself in the best possible position, 
uh, physically, mentally, spiritually, um, uh, socially, financially, if I do what it takes for myself to be optimal in all of those uh, aspects of life, um, it puts me in a better position to give back to others. And boy, what a world it would be if every, and I'm not saying be like John, I'm just saying my vision is, you know, what a world it would be if everybody was focused on, on giving to others. I'm not a communist. I'm not a socialist. I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to be a good guy. I'm trying to be my version. I'm trying to be what I think a good guy would be. Um, <laughs> don't judge me. I'm not judging anybody that isn't doing what I do, but I'm just saying I do what I do because I think it's the best thing to do. And isn't that the way everybody should live? And as long as you're not hurting anybody, you're doing a good thing, right? If you're not hurting, you're helping. I guess you could be ambivalent. I guess you could live in a cave and never interact with anyone. There's some monks up in Tibet that do that. Yeah. Anyway, most people aren't monks. If you're not, if you're not hurting, then why not help? Why not actively help? Why not seek to help? Why not seek to better your environment, whether that's a near environment or a far more broader environment? Again, I do not think it's corny to talk about things like that. Yeah, so that's the update. My uh, throat says I need to stop. Oh, yeah, uh, w one quick thing. Um, here, here's, a, here's a task that I'd like to put out there. Uh, do it if you think you'll benefit from it. You know, this is your choice. But let me just throw this out there. What can you as an individual do to benefit from social media? There's so much negative talk about social media, and there is a lot of negative uh, out there on social media, you know, the trolls and the lies and the conspiracy theories and crazy stuff like that. But there's also a lot of good out there. Let me just share a real quick example. Um, I think it was yesterday or maybe it was the first day after I got back from the, from the hospital. I don't remember, but my friend Keith Redmond, now Keith has been a guest on the coming home podcast with John Allen twice. So check him out on episode 69 and on episode 89 um, he, uh, a great guy, two great episodes that I had with him. Well, he contacted me a couple of days ago and he hooked me up with, uh, the names of two people. Uh, one of them is living in, is she, is she living in Washington, DC? And the other one is living in Paris. Two people that I never would have met and never would have known about, but he has hooked me up with some information on these two people. And, uh, strongly suggested that I have them on as podcast guests. So that's going to be coming up. Uh, it's Sunday today, tomorrow and Monday. I'm going to contact both of them. I don't really have the energy to do a full length podcast now. As you guys know, I run into the two hour range very often. Usually, in fact, the two hour range a couple times a week. I don't really have the energy for that right now, but I, I'm going to contact them tomorrow and schedule an episode with each one of them. And therein lies the beauty of, of um, networking, the beauty of social media. You know, I never would have met Keith if I hadn't started this podcast and had him on as a guest and established that long distance, you know, uh, uh, internet uh, uh, connection with Keith. Um. And this is something that I've experienced consistently since I've been on, I think I got on Facebook back in 2010, I want to say. I want to say 2010, so let's say 2010, <laughs> that I got on Facebook for the first time. I've experienced this consistently since then on Facebook and the other social media platforms where I am, Twitter, uh, Instagram and all that, where I meet people, and some of them I still haven't met face to face, but I meet them online. Uh, we chat on aud on audio and video chat, and we share. We ex it's not just yeah, hi, nice weather where I am. How are you? It's not just that. It's it's actual. It's an actual exchange of knowledge, of information. It's 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 networking in its truest form, and that is just that networking has just expanded. Um, exponentially since I started the podcast. So quick shout out to Keith Redmond 
Uh, you guys check him out on my podcast on episode 69 and 89. And when I book these two guests, I will make sure during the course of that podcast episode that I mentioned that I'm speaking with them because of Keith Redmond. So thank you, Keith Redmond. Okay. I believe I've been at this for 50 minutes and four seconds, five seconds, and that is long enough. Thank you guys for listening. Please go to my website, johnallenpod.com, J-O-H-N-A-L-A-N-P-O-D.com. And from there, you can find me across social media. Uh, Reach out to me. Let me know what you're thinking. Um, Let me know how you're feeling. Bye, everybody. Thank you and goodbye.